See, we have a quorum, all seven. Um, we'd like to make a motion to go into executive session. Mr. Chair, I make a motion we in an executive session with um, contractional and personnel matters. Mr. Chair, I second. Second. And second, all in favor, raise your hand. We have a 7 0 vote. Uh, for those that uh, was waiting on us to come out of the session, shouldn't last no more than 30 minutes, but I can guarantee you that it'll be shorter than that. The week before you enter the executive session. <laughs> Hey, how you doing? Uh, are you good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Time to come out of the executive session. Mr. Chair, yes, I make a motion we exit executive session. Second, first motion. Motion to make to come out of the executive session. Uh, yes, sir. 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 Dr. All in favor, raise your hand. They have seven out. Okay. We didn't get a vote from Joe Siegel. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right, let's see. All right. This time, Dr. Green, we will have our audit report presentation. Excuse me. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. This time we have our pledge of allegiance. I don't know. These players ain't working too good. Right. Just like to welcome everyone out there in YouTube land, uh, all our folks from Fairfield County to our December 15th board meeting. Uh, we know it's trying times right now, but uh, help is on the way. So we welcome you. At this time, we're going to move to our Pledge of Allegiance and our a moment of silence. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. One nation, 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 we're going to die here, you know, in my life. <laughs> so I welcome both of you on, and um, y'all really going to be happy to the board. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harris. And we will get to that in the board chair yeah. report. Uh, that's what I was waiting for. But thank you. Uh, approval of the agenda. Mr. Chair. Yes, ma'am. I make a motion we approve the agenda as presented. Thank you. Uh, motion made by Ms. Harris, second by uh, Ms. Green. Uh, all in favor, just raise your hand. We have a 7 0 vote. Thank you. Now we have moved to our audit report presentation. <laughs> All right, so y'all got four things in front of you. Y'all get one more than I normally have in front of you here. You've got a one page summary that's on top, it's got the yellow on it. Below that, 
All right. So what y'all have in front of you, you got four different things. You've got a summary page. You've got a final communication letter. You have your pupil activity compilation, which is the little book. Then you have the audit itself, which has your single audit, which is the big big book. And what I've tried to do is summarize the letter and the audit on that one page summary sheet. So we're just going to work straight off that summary sheet. Um, I am going to briefly touch on the letter, but you don't have to look through that if you don't want. Uh, what that letter is, is that is our final communication with the board as a whole. Uh, it summarizes your entire audit, uh, just at a very high level. Uh, some of the things that it talks about, it talks about if you adopted any new significant accounting policies, uh, which you did not this year. We anticipated you adopting GASB 84, which would have made your pupil activity or your, your activity accounts out of the school, uh, the different schools, uh, turning those into special revenue funds instead of being agency funds. And due to COVID, uh, GASB issued uh, statement 80 or statement 95, excuse me, which postponed the implementation of all of that. So I'm standing up here telling you again, you will probably <laughs> implement GASB 84 uh, for the 2021 fiscal year. Um, other things it talks about, it talks about if we had any uh, corrected or uncorrected misstatements. Um, all the identified misstatements that we did have uh, were corrected by management. None of those were material. Uh, and there were no uncorrected misstatements. We had no disagreements with management. Uh, management didn't go out and get a second opinion on the application of any accounting policies since you didn't adopt any new ones. Um, that would be mentioned in here as well. The only thing that we did mention, it says non-compliance with law, regulations, violations of contract provisions or grant agreements. So the part of our testing, what we do is we go and we pull a sample of AP or if accounts payable and a sample of payroll individuals. And when we pulled the payroll individuals testing our major program, which was the uh, special services area. So your, uh, your individuals with disabilities, uh, those funds as well as the preschool funds, we found two individuals um, who had the incorrect type. Well, they had the correct type of um, certification for their time. It just had the incorrect percentage on it. Something that we're, we're required to report to y'all at the board just so you're aware of it. Uh, it did not affect your audit in any way. You don't have an audit finding for that. Um, but just to make you aware of it as a board uh, so that you can do your fiscal and compliance responsibilities uh, to the best of your abilities. So if you look at that one page uh, summary sheet there, I'm going to kind of work in a counterclockwise way. Uh, so the top right corner, it talks about the audit as a whole. So you see the financial statement opinion is an unmodified opinion. That's the highest and best we can give. Um, so that's always nice to be able to stand up here and tell you that you had no material misstatements uh, and you got a clean audit opinion. Report on internal controls and your major program opinion. We had no findings related to your internal controls over financial reporting. And we had an unmodified opinion on your major program uh, and your compliance with the applicable compliance requirements over that, which was special services. And then you see there again, you had no findings. Government-wide financial summary on the top left talks about your statement of that position and your statement of activities. What these two uh, statements do is they take where the district really resides in the, in the governmental funds, in the, in the current aspect of the district. It builds in stuff like that lovely net pension and OPEB liability that we talk about every year. Uh, it, it builds in your capital assets, uh, and then it builds in your debt, your uh, long-term obligations. Uh, for debt. So you can see you had 68.9, almost $69 uh, million dollars in assets. You had deferred outflows of $10 million. Liabilities of 108. That's vastly made up of that net pension and OPEB liability. Deferred inflows of 7.5, almost 7.6, which gave you a negative net position of 36.7. 
Um, and then you can see on a on a full accrual or, or what, how a company might run. Expenses of 56 million, program revenues of 16.9, uh, and then general revenues and transfers of 37, giving you a net change for the year of roughly a two million dollar decrease. Straight across the middle there, I have a current year activity summary. So what this gives you an idea of is what was my beginning fund balance? How much did the fund bring in? How much did the fund expend and or transfer in and out? And where is, what is my net uh, fund balance? And I put this on here uh, just to show you, and I, I see a thing right there, actually special, your special projects is, um, that 68 should not be on there. It should be zero. Um, just to give you an idea. So we look at your special revenue fund, special projects, which is going to include your title one, your IDA, uh, your career and technology revenue that you get, as well as any state or local or other federal money that is restricted to be spent for a particular purpose. Um, that's what's going to be in that special project. EIA is under the EIA Proviso Act of 1984. Uh, those funds are all earmarked and tabbed for, for a particular purpose and intent. If you don't spend them, you carry them over. If you can carry them over, if not, you would remit those back to the state. And then you see your food service, debt service, and capital projects funds. Um, and, and with your fund balances there, you know, food service is about 150000 to sixty-five, almost $66,000 change there. A lot of that was due to COVID. Um, you know, you stop serving meals to students in the buildings starting in, in early to mid-March. So you, even though you're 100% free and you're still 100% free, you're losing out on things like um, supplemental sales or adults who have come in that you actually were uh, charging for those meals. Debt service, uh, we had a, a transfer catch up from last year and then a transfer this year. You're at 2.2 million there, and then you've got about 3.9, almost 4 million in capital projects to use in the future uh, to cover future capital projects, which is always a good place to be. I included uh, pupil activity just so you could see if we if we do end up implementing, if COVID doesn't have some other impact that we haven't seen. Your fund balance in total will pick up about 153,000 in that special projects column uh, by pulling in pupil activity. That's how it'll be pulled in. But what I really want to talk about just for a couple of minutes is your general funds. That's where the district really resides. That's where you bring in your general tax revenues, um, a large majority of your salaries and fringe and other expenditures are in there. So for the year 2020, you saw total revenues of 40. Million two hundred ninety-one thousand seven hundred fifty-two dollars. That was a two point five, almost two point six million dollar decrease from the prior year, and it was approximately two point nine million dollars less than you had budgeted. If you look at your current um, expenditures, current expenditures of forty-two point two million. That was a two point six, almost two point seven million dollar increase. But you are $3 million under budget, which is always a good place to be. Um, you transferred in a million dollars. That was $176,000 more than you transferred in in the prior year. And it was a, a little over you know, $27,000 uh, below what you budgeted. So you budgeted a net deficit uh, in the general fund of a million dollars, which is the million dollars you had set aside. Um, in, in years prior for some activities that you knew were going to take place in 1920. Um, and it ended up coming out um, only using about $825,000 of fund balance. So you can see there that you had anticipated the million, you only spent the 825, so you came out about $175,000 uh, to the better than your budget as a whole. To give you an idea of where your fund balance of $13,940,000 stands, it's 33% of your current 2019-2020 actual expenses. So that $42.2 million number. And it was 30.7% of your budgeted expenditures of $45,265,101. And that's key to know 
because of your continuing resolution, which rolled your 2019 budget, your, your 1920 budget to 2021. So you're still sitting roughly at that 30.7%, which are, which your fund balance you carry in as a percentage of your 2021 budget. Um, just to give you an idea of what that $800,000 did, took you from about 37% fund balance to 33. Still well over what the state requires of the 8%. Um, you're looking at about four months, uh, which we always like to see anywhere from two to three months. So four months is excellent to be able to have. Uh, that gives you the ability, if something you know dramatic or drastic were to, were to happen, you can get a short-term plan in place prior to the expiration of all of that fund balance and it being used up. Um, I also kind of looked at your revenues. The big one that stuck out to me, you know, your local revenue went down $2,671,000. Well, ad valorem taxes went down to $2.5 million. I think everyone in this room is familiar with the big tax implication of what's transpired in the county over the past year. Um, so I think that's that's a large part. You also saw interest go down about a hundred thousand, and we've seen interest rates obviously declining that are being paid out as um, the market's done better, and then as as COVID hit, we really saw interest rates uh, decrease. Expenditures for the year went up two point six million, almost two point seven. That was all, all predominantly in instruction and support and predominantly in the salaries that were paid out as well as the related fringe. Um, so increase in salaries, you're going to see um, obviously an increase in your fringe benefits with retirement, um, FICA, all those others. But then you also have your, your annual increase that you're seeing in your retirement rates as well. Um, but all in all, a good year. I mean, you, you, you knew, you anticipated you plan, you set aside uh, for what you anticipated and planned to budget into the deficit, and then you actually bettered and, and still achieved the objective of what you were trying to do this year um, and, and did not use that whole million dollars that you had set aside. Um, so it's a very good year. Uh, it's a testament to Mr. Robinson and his entire staff because you had a very good year on top of switching accounting softwares, which is never an easy task um, to get everybody to understand it and, and to buy into it. Uh, but they have done an excellent job of doing that. Um, and we're able to, as always, get us everything we needed to be able to do and complete the audit uh, on time. Are there any questions? Is that Mr. Holiday? That, that you? No, I'm I'm Andrew Dobson. Say that again. Andrew Dobson. Andrew. It's good, to, it's good to meet you, sir. It's good. It's good to meet you in person. Yes, I know sir. we've talked on the phone. But yes, sir. It's good to meet you in person. Now, would you uh, explain this unmodified opinion? So, so there's a couple of different types of opinions that that we as auditors can give. There's an unmodified opinion. There's a qualified. We can issue an adverse opinion or disclaimer. Um, so an unmodified opinion, what that means is it's the highest and best we can give. You have no material misstatements. Um, and, and what that basically entails is we do a calculation based off the of different risk factors um, and different numerical values. So it might be revenues or total assets based on what we're looking at. Are we looking at capital assets where we might use total assets? Are we looking at, you know, one of these funds where we may use revenues? Uh, and we, we look at your financials to make sure that there's nothing contained within there that would mislead, misguide, or is a material mistake. So if it rises over the level of whatever that number may be, uh, we consider that a material mistake. So if, if you saw something like that and it, in the district did not want to correct it, you might see something that would be a qualified opinion. Um, a lot of times you see qualified opinions on your major programs. Uh, if you have a significant material uh, compliance issue, if you were supposed to, I mean, I'm trying to think of a good example. If you misspent money or if you uh, 
said when you when you did a federal claim that you spend it in one pot and you really spend it in another pot, you might see a qualified opinion there and then it would explain that. But for a financial statement as a whole, an unmodified opinion is the highest and best opinion that we can get. It means you can see what we commonly or you might commonly uh, hear is a clean audit. Any questions? If y'all do think of any questions, or when you're trying to go to sleep at night, you start reading this video, think it'll put you to sleep. <laughs> On that sheet is my name and my phone number. If anybody has a question, you are more than welcome to call me, find me on our website, email me, ask Dr. Green or Mr. Robinson for my email, or how to get in touch with me. We work at the pleasure of the board. Uh, we work for the board. That's a common um, thing that we we talk to the board about. Um, you know, we don't we work for the district, but we actually are hired by the board to come in and audit the district. So we work directly for you, um, and we have enjoyed working with y'all. I think we've been working with y'all since 2013, maybe, uh, in that time frame. And I've been I've been working on y'all's audit since since the inception since we got it um, from your prior auditor. So I have enjoyed enjoyed our time working on it. Um, but like I said, if y'all have any questions about it, anything pops up and you go, okay, well, what about this? You're more than let, welcome to let myself or Mr. Robinson know, and, and one of us will get you an answer. Jim, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was last year when our board meeting you had said that uh, we had one of the best audits in the state that you have ever seen. Are we still? Y'all are still doing extremely well, yes. Yes. Um, and, and, and I'll say this. To, to be able to do what y'all do in your district, um, I mean, you, the way y'all treat your teachers, the way you treat your employees, the way you show them that they are um, desired by this board and by this district reaches farther than you can imagine. I have other districts asking me what y'all are doing to be able to recruit and retain the talent that you have. Um, because they're trying to emulate it at their district. Um, but to be able to do all that and keep a 33% fund balance is outstanding. Um, and it's really a testament to the, the fiscal responsibility of everybody involved. I mean, from the board down to, you know, uh, Dr. Green to, to Mr. Robinson's whole team of making sure that you are spending your dollars wisely that you are spending your dollars accurately and you're spending them effectively on the things this district needs to be able to survive and to excel, not just survive, but to excel going forward. Thank you. Any more questions? Excuse me, I'm just asking all of them to remember to use your light for now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. I appreciate it. And we're going to move on to our board minutes, uh, November the 10th, and as well as November 17th, if we can put those both together in a motion. Mr. Chair. Yes, ma'am. I make a motion. We um, approve the board minutes from the um, minutes from November the 10th special call board meeting and also November the 17th regular call board meeting. I second. Thank you. Uh, this motion was made by uh, Ms. Harris and second by Mr. Davis. Any questions? We're going to call for the vote. All in favor of approving the board member minutes. Raise your hand, please. We have a seven row vote. Thank you. At this time, we're going to have our superintendent update announcement. Chair Miller, members of the board, uh, first of all, let me take this opportunity to commend students, parents, faculty, and staff 
Uh, for Ezra uh, John navigating what has been an unprecedented time. Uh, I have said many, many times before, um, no one ever envisioned that we'd be operating schools in the era of a pandemic. Uh, and, and the doctor and staff has been extremely committed, uh, extremely flexible. Uh, parents have had to accept some responsibilities that they never imagined they would have to. Uh, for those students who are being educated virtually. Uh, our students have been asked to uh, adhere to some safety protocols uh, that many predicted that they would not uh, adhere to. Uh, and I can tell you, uh, students are uh, graciously adhering to our policy of wearing masks. Uh, they are doing a, a relatively good job of social distancing and, uh, and, and keeping the area sanitized. And so, I wanted to start off by saying that I'd be remiss if I didn't thank everyone in the Fairfield County uh, for doing an excellent job of operating during this very, very difficult time. Uh, and next thing I want to just give you an update on. Uh, we have currently approximately 1,029 students who are reporting for in-person instruction. Uh, and, and that number tends to increase uh, every a wonderful request for special consideration. And so parents are, as much as the infection rates are rising, not only across the country, but in our respective communities, families continue to have confidence in our ability as a district to provide a safe environment uh, for their most prized possession, their children. Uh, we just uh, completed uh, the window for our fourth round of requests for special consideration. And, and to remind you, that is an opportunity uh, for parents who were previously at leveraging the virtual option to make a request for their young people report for in-person instruction. And so we have an additional 122 students uh, who are likely to transition for in-person instruction uh, once we return back in January. And so we continue to have parents uh, who are interested in leveraging the virtual option, who are becoming more and more confident uh, in our ability to create a safe environment. Uh, you know, many have asked, how are we doing relative to COVID-19? Uh, and so I want to kind of let you know where we are at this point in time, and I'm looking at aggregate data over the course of the year. So this school year, we've had uh, 34 students and 24 staff members who have been confirmed positive for COVID-19. Okay, 34 students and 24 staff members. I remind people that does not mean that we had 34 students and 24 staff members who came into contact with COVID-19 in school. That means that we have people who are affiliated with our system uh, who came into contact with COVID-19. Our contact tracing confirms almost without exception that that, that almost all of the people who came into contact with the virus were part of our system ended up coming to, into contact outside of our system. And so people say, well, how can you say that with certainty, JR? And, and obviously I couldn't say it with a 100% certainty, but when we do contact tracing and we start looking at who you have come into close contact with, we can pretty much narrow down at least where it did not occur, okay? Um, and our contract tracing, confirms that we aren't seeing spread in schools. And so let me give you an example. Let's say someone came into contact with the virus, reported to school, we later found out, um, uh, but they were in close contact with some individuals in schools. Our safety for cause of mitigating the likelihood that we would see transmission with the positive person among other people in our system. And so our, our protocols have done a very good job of limiting any potential spread in schools. And so I, I, I want to reiterate that final point because often people say, well, I looked at the DHEP website and I saw that there were students at XYZ school who, who had contracted COVID-19. Uh, DHEP puts that disclaimer there to say, does that mean they came in contact with their school? That just means that there's a kid who goes to the school right, right. who is positive for COVID-19. He could have come into contact with the virus at the mall, at church, at a family reunion, at a wedding. He could come into contact with the virus anywhere. 
Uh, let me just say that he is a student at that respective school. I'll tell you in many instances, uh, we have in our communication with students and staff members, that they were relatively familiar with who they came in contact with. So in other words, a wife may say, well, my husband uh, a, came in contact with the virus and me and my children ended up contracting the virus as well from him. So uh, our contact tracing has been very, very effective in terms of limiting uh, the likelihood that we would see community spread. You know, the, the question has been asked, uh, you know, Superintendent, well, I'm watching other districts who make some modifications. Uh, you know, you're thinking about doing something different in Taylor County. Uh, and obviously, we are continuing to, to, to observe those numbers. But, but at this point in time, we feel pretty confident uh, that things are going well here. In the event that it changes, obviously, we will uh, make some adjustments. Basketball and wrestling have been canceled at least for the remainder of the semester. Uh, and that is a primarily a function of Richmond 1 and Richmond 2 canceling sports. So it's not that we canceled sports, but Richmond 1 and Richmond 2 canceled sports until after the Christmas holidays. And our next several matches and basketball games were with Richmond 1 and Richmond 2 schools. So by default, uh, our season has been postponed as well until after we return from the Christmas holiday. Um, are there any questions? I mean, I've said a lot. I know there may be a few questions that you have, so let me. Okay, um, Mr. Chair, yes, Dr. Green, I know, um, and I'm glad that parents are, you know, confident on sending their kids back to school, but has there been conversations with, like, teachers, administrators, any concern about the numbers of people coming back into the schools because I know it's concerns all around the state. I got plenty of calls. I know you don't got some calls. I know people talk to talk to you. Um, the numbers are very alarming, and I'm just wondering if there's any conversations with teachers and administrators and stuff, and you know how they're feeling. I mean, especially the teachers, because I know a lot of them are really concerned about you know, especially if they have like underlying conditions and stuff. Um, has there been any kind of conversation like to know, you know, their perspective on all the kids that come back? Yeah, well, that's a good question, Terrence. I mean, obviously, um, I spent a lot of time in schools and, and going in our classes and talking to teachers and, and students and parents as well. Um, you know, anytime you're operating in the era of a pandemic, there is going to be a certain level of anxiety. And no one is not going to uh, suggest that there is not. Uh, I'll tell you. Uh, most of the teachers that I have spoken to are confident in the protocols that we have put in place. Uh, they are confident relative to the class sizes that we have in Fairfield County. Um, different than maybe some other places, we don't have a lot of students um, with excessive class sizes, which increases the level of comfort for, for staff. Um, Ms. Harris and I, I uh, as I said, I frequently talk to teachers uh, we have a teacher phone group that I meet with regularly uh, to get input. I talk to principals uh, since they talk to teachers every day. Uh, and we're constantly monitoring uh, the climate relative to where we are. Uh, I, I still feel confident uh, that we're in a place that we can maintain the learning environment that we currently have. Um, I continue to monitor the numbers uh, and in particular, the level of spread that occurs in our facilities. Uh, I continue to monitor uh, the, the amount of quarantine and isolation that we have to do as a result uh, of any potential uh, exposure to COVID-19. Uh, so um, it, it is obviously an unprecedented situation that we continue to navigate, uh, but I think relatively speaking, we are in a, a pretty good place. Thank you, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Dr. Green, you had said that there's going to be 122 more children uh, that's going to be coming back to school in January, and that will be the fourth round of admission. Yeah. How many more rounds are you going to have, and when, or, and do you have a cap yeah. in regards? I know that there's some, at the high school, it was 13 children per classroom. Is that the same with all schools? Is there a different number? 
Yeah. yeah. So, so just clarify what Ms. Green is talking about. Ms. Green is saying that we could effectively social distance classes with six feet of distance between each student right. with 13 kids in class. Not that any class that's 15, because obviously some classes have less exactly. than, they have less For than, sure. than, than 13, you're saying that's the maximum. Uh, so Ms. Green, in terms of how many rounds we're going to have, and so initially when we developed the plan, we said that we would revisit give the fans an opportunity uh, to, to basically change their minds and, and request face-to-face -face instruction at the end of four and a half weeks. Uh, we did a second round at the end of nine weeks. Um, we didn't do a third round initially. Um, not, you know, we did do a third round initially. We didn't do a fourth round initially. Uh, but after hearing from several parents uh, who said, hey, I mean, I know initially I wanted my child to be virtual, uh, but he just thought thriving in this environment. Uh, is there any way you could do a, a, a fourth round? And so uh, I said, okay, we're going to do a fourth round and see whether we still have a substantial number of students out there uh, who, who are interested in pursuing face-to-face -face instruction. Rather, we we'll continue to do that, Ms. Green, is based on a couple of things, all right? First of all, do we have the capacity to accommodate additional students, all right, uh, in a safe manner? Uh, the, the second thing we'll look at is, what is the level of community spread of the virus at the time that we consider pursuing that? Uh, and then finally, uh, am I hearing from lots of parents who are saying, we need an additional round today, we rather students can report to in person. And so I'm not been, been firm as green on saying this is it in terms of giving parents an opportunity to basically change their mind. Um, there were some districts who said, once you make a commitment to go virtual, we gotta stay there for the entire year. We gotta stay there for the entire semester. And so some people twisted the wisdom of what we have been doing. Uh, I, and we have deferred giving parents a lot of leverage and opportunity to change their mind. Uh, and obviously, uh, it's always advantageous if we can do that. Uh, but, but there does come a point where we potentially may not be able to. So I give you a long, long answer to say, I don't know. Okay, uh, I, I'm not telling you that we won't do an additional round. I'll tell you that we will continue to monitor after this round to see where we are. Can we still effectively social distance? Are we still creating a safe environment? And if we could do all those things and potentially get more students than face to face, we want to do it. Okay, uh, but if we can't do it, then we have to tell parents who are in a position to do so. And so with being final, I'll say a lot of that is contingent on, 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 on where we're going relative to the virus. You know, it's very difficult to make those kinds of predictions. I mean, we could come back after Christmas and things could go haywire. And I said, you know what? We can all that accommodate the students we have. We might have to pull back some. Uh, or, or things could get a lot better. So it is a very fluid situation that we continue to monitor and adjust with. Um, but, but I'll tell you where we are right now relative to level of spread in the building, I, I feel confident that we can accommodate enough for the 22 kids. That's throughout the district. That's throughout the district. And so I, I think it's important to note if I say 122 kids, that's throughout the district. All right. And so if you had, I'm just throwing out numbers, if you had, you know, 10 kids at a core list and 40 kids at the middle school and 20 kids that you know what I mean? It's throughout the district. And hopefully, as you spread 122 throughout the district, it doesn't have that significant of an impact in any one particular class. If I only so, if you say 122 kids throughout the district, that could theoretically only equate to a couple of kids in any one class. And, and, and there may be no kids in some other class. Any more questions? Yes. Um, Mr. Chair, yes, sir. a question for the superintendent. Um, you know, government masters want to put these tests in the schools, and uh, some have said yes, and some have said no, they're not willing to do the testing, but we still undecided. Some of the concerns from the parents are why are we still undecided? Could you please inform us on what's going on with that? Yeah, yeah. So, so Governor McMaster has made rapid COVID tests available to schools. Um, the first point that a lot of parents and community members don't recognize is these tests are only to be administered to symptomatic individuals. 
Okay? Not to be another sanctuary one. Only people who have been symptoms and only certain symptoms. Okay? And so, for example, they say, well, if you lost your taste of uh, smell and you, uh, you, 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 your taste of smell uh, and, and, and you can't taste, then you can, you can take this test. Or you have a severe shortness of breath, or you've had a consistent fever, or you've had uh, uh, two different other symptoms for a consistent period of time. Our position has been, Mr. Davis, if you're experiencing those symptoms, we don't want you to come to school. <laughs> and so that really contradicts really what we have been promoting. Uh, and so some of the districts have said, we don't want to create a policy where we are telling parents to send sick kids to school so they can be tested, all right? You got a sick kid, we want you to take him to a DSDH testing site. We want you to take him to CVS. We want you to take him to the Lake Mountain, I mean, to the Mount Cellar Clinic. We want you to take him someplace else and not send him to school. Some of the people who've heard kind of that snapshot think that this is a test for anyone, all right? And, 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 and the big piece that they missed is only for people who have symptoms. So you already are experiencing COVID symptoms. That's who the test is to be administered to. So myself and others have said, uh, we aren't sure whether that is a prudent course of action because what could happen is you go from limited spread in schools to now massive spread in schools because now you're bringing a bunch of sick people to school. Now, what some other schools have said is, and this is something that no one has really discussed, and schools who have, have agreed to administer the COVID-19 test have said, we're going to administer it, but we aren't going to do it at our school. We're going to set up satellite sites someplace else. So if a sick kid comes to school, we're going to tell the parent, well, you're going to have to take him someplace else, make an appointment, and then you go to one of those satellite sites. So even for some of those districts who have accepted the rapid test, but that necessarily suggests that they're going to give tests in their building because they have the same concerns that I just articulated. Right? Uh, and right now, I really don't see a huge benefit to us administering rapid tests. It is only for symptomatic individuals. Um, you know, right now, DHEC is administering uh, COVID tests at Old Fairfield Memorial Hospital every Thursday and Friday. Uh, you can get a DH test at, at CVS. You can get a DH test in Winsboro. I can't remember the, the local health plan that you can get in, um, in, in, um, at the, um, the, the Lake Monticello Health Clinic. So I, I, don't, I don't think we have a, uh, an issue with testing sites. Uh, and, and, and those tests can be administered to anyone, symptomatic or not. All right. And so I, I, I'm just struggling to see uh, how us administering tests to, to symptomatic people would be beneficial to the district. In addition to all the manpower, uh, the disposal protocols, uh, and all of the other things that will come along with administering this assessment. Thanks, sir, for clearing that up. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Davis, I want to ask you, can you speak to the accuracy of these tests? Yeah, that's a very good question, Pastor, uh, Pastor Jackson. So the, the reason DHEC says that they only want you to administer the test to symptomatic individuals is because if you administer it to asymptomatic individuals, um, the accuracy is only about 60 percent. Okay. Um, and, you know, 60 percent is almost a cold cause. All right. I mean, I, I, that's not very accurate. Um, there is still a suggestion that even if you give it to symptomatic individuals, it's not as accurate as some people would suggest that it is. Uh, and so I think it then goes down to how extensive are the symptoms that an individual is experiencing uh, to contribute to whether it is going to be an accurate assessment. I, you know, I've been telling parents, students, staff, I would recommend that you go take one of these traditional molecular PCR tests. It's going to take you about 48 hours to get back. But they're gonna be 90 plus percent accurate. And it doesn't matter whether you have any symptoms or not. And so the, the, the rapid tests are obviously convenient. You can get up, you can get them back in, in, in 15 minutes, sometimes even less. But I read an article about three weeks ago where, where a physician said, 
You can have one or the other. You can have accuracy or you can have convenience, but you won't have both. Okay, and so you can get convenience when you can get it back in 10 minutes, but you're going to sacrifice an accuracy. All right. Me, I, I would probably advise parents to say, let, let's, let's go with the accuracy for a little bit less convenience. You know, I, I took a call, I think it's several called the parents. But, but I took me, my wife, and, and, uh, and, and two of my daughter. We went up to CVS last Friday, I think it was, uh, and took a, a COVID test. It was drive through, no squad. We went through all the protocols, uh, and we got, everyone got their results back, I think, by Tuesday. Uh, so it went on all the way. Uh, I mean, it was, it was about 48 business hours. Um, so I encourage people. Uh, as opposed to going around the tails, go with the traditional molecular PCR. Because it's the most, and they kind of call it the gold standard of testing. They say that is the most accurate. Any more questions? Yes, sir. 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 Yes,
you can share any concerns that have been expressed uh, since the last time we met. So it's every teacher of the year from the preceding year. So for example, at the high school would have been Ms. Taylor, who was the who was the Central High School Teacher of the Year and the District Teacher of the Year. Do you think there's any way that you could maybe include more teachers on your forum? For example, lead teachers from different departments as well as the the teacher of the year from the specific schools? Yeah, and so yeah, I mean, we also could do that. I mean, this was just a model that I had seen yeah, somebody I mean, else. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that's something I'm going to consider to add uh, yeah, additional teachers. Yeah, yeah. The, the only thing you have to consider the screen is you got to pick a, a size group where you can actually have that kind of intimate dialogue conversation. If I'm so if it's me and nine teachers, we can really have some pretty extensive dialogue now. If it's me and 50 teachers, if you follow me, then it's, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to have that kind of intimate conversation. So I'm going to say nine is the right number, uh, you know, maybe 15, I, mean, I don't know what the right number is, but that's probably the one thing I would consider is you want it to be a size where you can still have some kind of intimate conversation and, and not be overwhelming in terms of too many people that really have that kind of dialogue. But what I'll do is the next the next forum I'll, I'll have some conversation with them just to get some thoughts from them in terms of um, who they think would be good to add and what number they think would be reasonable and just get some feedback from them also. Well, during, uh, is it have you got any information on this on our state budget uh, for us? Uh, you know what we're going to do? Or have you heard anything? Yeah, so, so Mr. Miller, you know, right now, the, the General Assembly has indicated that, that, you know, obviously the reoccurring money is, is much less than they had anticipated. Um, there's a lot more one time money that they're working with. Uh, you probably read where the state superintendent had asked the General Assembly uh, to institute the 2% raise that they initially said teachers were going to get. Um, in talking to some members of the General Assembly, they indicated that it's not likely to occur retroactively for this year. Uh, obviously, that could change. Um, uh, but they're going to really push to include it in the budget for next year, 2021-2022. Uh, uh, and Mr. Miller, I mean, everyone is, 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 you know, is predicting that it's going to be a tough budget year. Uh, because of COVID, uh, tax revenues are expected to be down. Um, and, you know, we're hoping for the Okay. Um, uh, and so we, we'll, we'll just have to see what works out. Any more questions for our superintendent? Thank you, Dr. Green. Our next. Uh, which was uh, our superintendent contract. Uh, we uh, we definitely need a, uh, I think we need an emotion on that. Um, Mr. Chair. Yes, ma'am. I move the Board of Trustees in Fairfield County District authorize you as chair to execute an amendment to the superintendent contract extending the term of the contract for one year or until june 30th 2025. can i get a second on that second that by mr green all in, all in favor because we don't have a contract we don't, we don't say anything all in favor raise your hand Any extension? Y'all raise your hand again because I want to make sure we get the count right. right. We got seven of them. Dr. Harris, I, I seen that I, I picked up the left hand on, on you. I was looking for the right. Yes, sir. Thank you. We got seven of them. All right. So we move. Mr. 
Mr. Mr. Mr. Miller. Yes, ma'am. Before we move on, first of all, I, I'd like to thank the board for the confidence you've shown in me to extend me one additional year. Uh, this is my ninth year in Fairfield County as superintendent. Uh, it has been absolutely an awesome experience uh, for me and my entire family, and I appreciate uh, the fact that you have extended me an additional year. I, you know, I told Mr. Miller that when I leave Fairfield, I'm, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to do something else. I'm not sure what my next move is going to be, but, uh, but uh, you know, this has been you know, such a great uh, place to work, and, and we've experienced such success here. Uh, and it is a testament to the leadership that you all have shown over the years. And, uh, and the extension says to me uh, that you are as committed to me uh, as you uh, have asked me to be to you. And so for that, I say thank you. Thank you, Dr. Green, uh, for those kind of words. Uh, student assessment update. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Chairman Miller, members of the board, and Dr. Green. Tonight's presentation will provide an overview of the state assessment results for the 2019-2020 school year. Student achievement data from the advanced placement AP examination, along with the dual credit course information, our test data that, that uh, from the spring will also be shared, along with the 2019 graduation. The United States Department of Education approves Pakistan's request to waive spring statewide assessment, accountability ratings, and certain reporting requirements in the ESSA for the 2019-2020 school year due to widespread school closures related to COVID-19. For those of you who have been a part of the board for some time, this presentation is going to be a, a more brief because, um, as you all know, with the shutdown in March, um, some of the assessments that we typically present to you are unavailable because of the shutdown. And so the SC Pass, SC Ready, and the Access for ELLs were not administered to our students due to the shutdown. And in addition, the end of the course assessments and the SAT data are incomplete due to the shutdown that took place this past spring. Our Fairfield Central High School students were very fortunate to take dual credit courses from Winthrop, Minton Technical College, and USC Lancaster. They earned 428 college credits on last year. During the 2019-20 school year, students had the opportunity to take 16 dual credit courses at no cost to them. Over 85% of our students who completed six hours of dual enrollment enroll in work earned a C or better on their dual enrollment coursework. Moving to our advanced placement assessment results, what exactly is an AP score and what does it mean? An AP score shows how well a student does on an AP examination. And it's also a determinant or a measure of how the student will do on a college AP course. Now, scores are weighted on a combination of scores on a multiple choice section and a free response section. However, with the um, massive shutdown that took place in the spring, the AP, the college board elected to change the format of the test. Students were allowed to take the test online. They could do a free response um format and they have the opportunity to take the assessment either at home or they can come into the school building to take the assessment now students um the final score on an ap exam is weighted um as follows or rated as follows on this following scale a five is the highest score which means students are extremely well qualified a four is equivalent to well qualified a three is qualified, a two is possibly qualified, and a one equates to no recommendation. If a student earns a three or more or higher score, then they're considered qualified. And if they earn a three or higher score, they will earn college credit 
for that AP course in which they took or the AP exam. So students have an opportunity to earn a college credit with a score of three or higher on the AP examination. Moving on to our advanced placement results. During the spring, our students, as I stated earlier, took the AP exams online. 51 students took the AP exam last school year as compared to 53 students in the previous year. Additionally, 14 students in 2020 last spring took the examination and earned a three or above score on the AP examination. Seven students scored a three or above in US history. One student scored a three or above on the literacy exam. Six scored a three or above in calculus. And as I stated earlier, 14 overall passed with a three or higher score. In addition to that, we have one student score a score, achieved a score of five on the calculus exam, and one student achieved a score of five on the US history examination. So overall, we are very pleased with the results and the improvement of the results from the 2019 to the 2020 school year. Our graduation rate, our on-time graduation rate increased from 81% in 2019 to 88% in 2020. The graduation rate increased by seven percentage points and it also exceeded the state's graduation rate, which was 82%. So we exceeded the state's graduation rate by six percentage points. In summary, I'd like to share with you just some quick highlights. And I, I stated these earlier, but I think it's worth mentioning again. 428 dual credits were earned by our students this past academic year. Two of those students achieved a score a five or more, a, a score of five on the AP exam. And 85% of our students who completed six hours, which equates to two college courses in dual enrollment college work, earned a C or better. Um, this concludes, the, as I stated earlier, the very brief presentation. Um, are there any questions? Um, I just want to uh, commend everybody, Dr. Green, the staff, um, and conversations that I've been having with so many people. These children have lived through a pandemic that some of them completely don't understand what's going on, and some of them are doing exceptionally well. Um, they're going to have a story to tell. <laughs> I mean, we had kids to graduate that probably couldn't start college at the beginning, or they started and then had to come back home. Um, it only made them stronger. Um, they've been through stuff that none of us have ever been through. Um, during their younger days, we got the little babies that just started school that couldn't because they got a little three-year-old niece that didn't understand why she couldn't go in class. But she's loving the virtual learning. She's excited just like she's in class. So, I mean, I just commend everybody um, for a job well done, uh, helping these kids and parents get through this pandemic. Um, it's just... Hopefully next year they hit a level out that you know we can have some kind of normalcy going on. But I, I, I just commend these kids, the young ones, the babies, the older ones that's going to college, and I commend all of y'all. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Harrison. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. As you said, these kids have been navigating some very, very difficult times. Uh, you know, it, it was so refreshing. I was at the basketball game on uh, this past Friday night, and, and several of the students who were in college uh, came to the game and had an opportunity to kind of talk to them about how they were doing. Uh, and almost without exception, every student that I spoke to told me they were doing great. Uh, now, some of them weren't necessarily on campus because of COVID 19, they were at home and taking their classes virtually. Uh, some of them were on campus in the fall, but won't be going back to the spring. Uh, but I, I'm telling you, you know, they didn't bring the great report, but I take your word for it. Uh, every day I talked to them, they said, uh, Dr. Green, it's not a great year. I'm on the D's list. I got all A's, one B. I mean, everybody had great stories to tell. Uh, I was talking to a parent today uh, whose daughter uh, is, a, is a nursing major at USC Upstate, and I was asking her how her daughter was doing, and she said she had all these one B. 
and I said, you know, that's the kind of that, that's kind of report I like to hear. And uh, and so that says to us, uh, we are doing an excellent job of preparing these young folks. I want to just say this finally: when we when we look at these dual credit courses that young people earned uh, in our system last year, that equates to real money. Because every credit that you earn at Kansas Central High School is a credit you don't have to pay for once you get to college. And I talked to a father uh, in Bilo just last week whose daughter graduated from the University of South Carolina, who's on our first STEM cohort. Uh, uh, and it was, I want him to say her name, Megan Pearson. Megan Pearson's father. And, and Megan graduated from the University of South Carolina uh, just this past week. Um, after two and a half years at USC, uh, and and two and a half years, and, and that's a function of these dual credit courses that she earned while she was at Fairfield Central High School. Uh, and I remind people that's real money, okay? Because if you want to pay the University of South Carolina to pay those courses, there's something else you can do with that money. And so, uh, even as we look at AP courses, and I've told you this before. A lot of kids, if they can qualify, they're elected to take the dual credit course at the university AP course because there is no final test associated with receiving the college credit. Uh, and so that's why you see a lot more kids in law that I can qualify. Sometimes it's difficult to qualify if they saw the tech standards. They're going with the dual credit option. But uh, I saw that firsthand as a father because I have two daughters in college and they got everything. Uh, I got two of that same time. So, 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 so these credits that they earn, uh, you know, we we going to have to get them out of there. But I, you know, I, my, my, you know, so I say that to say I know how that is from a parent's perspective. And sometimes we don't think about the importance of that. We just say, oh, they earn some credit. But no, so that's real money, and that's every, every credit that they don't have to pay for. Uh, that's money in their parents' pockets. I just wanted to share that point with. Well, well, since you said that, Dr. Green, how are we coming along with the Promise Program? Yeah, and so Promise Program is going very well, Mr. Miller. I, uh, I constantly remind young people to take advantage of that opportunity. Um, they, they have six semester uh, of, of credit for middle technical college at no cost. Uh, and just imagine the advantage that provides the young people in Fairfield County and their families. I was talking to a buddy of mine whose daughter is attending Middle Center College right now, who graduated from a local school district. And I said, Doc, don't you know if your daughter graduated from school in Fairfield, she could be going to Middle State for free. And they said, What? I said, I mean, if she ain't graduated from school here, yeah. you know, our promise program, and they get an opportunity to go for six semesters. Mr. Mill, I tell you, we did see the numbers fall off a bit because of COVID 19. And so you, you did have some students who said, I want a full go college for a minute. I'm still a little uncomfortable, uh, and I'm not 100 percent sure about the virtual environment. Uh, but I expect that to pick right back up once we get on the other side uh, of this COVID crisis. And so um, that, that is an awesome opportunity for our young people, and I appreciate the board's willingness uh, to move forward with that initiative. Any more questions for uh, Dr. Avery? Yeah, I uh, no, uh, Mr. Miller, I don't have a question, but I have a comment uh, along the lines of, of what uh, Ms. Harrison and, and uh, Dr. Green were just talking about, about the Promise Program. Uh, we need to talk it up, and, and what we need to do in addition to that is trying to convince people that they need to go take the vaccine and um, try to help put this stuff to rest so that we can get back to some semblance, as, as Ms. Harrison said, some semblance of normalcy. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's too much um, false information out there, right. and, 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 and folk are uh, reluctant to, you know, embrace the cure. Yes, You, you know, uh, let me just one final thing. I um, I spoke to Dr. Swilly on the internet yesterday. Tuesday, I told Dr. Swilly on Sunday uh, in this Chisholm. Uh, and we are working on a feature uh, of all of our graduates uh, from Texas Central High School who have graduated from college this semester. And I think that would be uh, a good opportunity to start highlighting those individuals 
every semester and really talk about what where they are now. And so I know Mr. Davis had a dog who graduated from University of South Carolina on Sunday. Uh, I spoke about Megan Pearson, uh, Gabriel Fista, graduated industrial te technology from Middle Texas College. And I saw, uh, 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 what's Malik's last name? Uh, now that Malik, Malik Pete graduated from University of South Carolina with a degree in engineering. And, and these are just some kids and some, some parents that I had spoken to or saw on social media. Uh, but, but we've had lots of kids who continue to excel uh, once they matriculate from our system. Uh, and we need to continue to highlight their successes. And so when people talk about our ability to prepare young people to move to the next level, uh, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, there's no question about whether our young people have been prepared. Uh, they are showing it in their deeds and their actions. So uh, we, we are working, and we count on a time crunch, but I spoke to Dr. Swilly and his children about how to put something together to really highlight uh, and, and we can do this every semester uh, at the end of the semester when we have graduates. And I know we have more coming uh, for the spring, uh, but since we have some coming at the end of the fall, we want to start highlighting those individuals. Any more questions? Any more comments? Any more questions? Any more comments? Any more questions? Any more questions? Good evening. Good evening. And, uh, full of packets this evening. The first item is the finance report for the month of November for board review. And if there are no questions, then we'll move on to the second item under operations and finance, with the, which is the audit contract extension. The, the uh, superintendent's requesting guidance from the board of trustees regarding the auditor's contract, um, the district's audit, audit firm, their contract ends in March of 2021. And so they're proposing an extension to that board contract for the um, owner's consideration. Yeah, I, I, I want to just share a bit of information. So, so Mr. Miller, members of the board, I spoke to the uh, all the firm's representative. He confirmed that the rates would be the same if we went with three years versus five years, so and there would be no change in terms of the fees associated. And so, I want to provide that information uh, for you for your pleasure, Mr. Chair. Um, I like to make a motion. Uh, do I need to amend it for the three years? Yeah, just, yeah. Okay, um, I amend the um, the motion to extend the contract from five years to three years. Um, provide and I get a second. A second. Questions? All in favor of uh, as we change the, the contract to three years? Raise your hand, please. We have a 7 0 vote. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Robinson, again, outstanding job. Just want to uh, let you know how much we appreciate you keeping us straight on this finance because you can get in a lot of trouble. We can get in a lot of trouble. The district can get in a lot of trouble. We know that you're very conservative. And, uh, I told him, I told him, I said, uh, we were talking about, uh, what we were talking about, about, about three or four million dollars. We ended up with 800 and 
How much? Eight hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. You know, right up Outstanding job. You know, the way y'all just made that. Uh, we made up right at three million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So, Mr. Miller, what, what happened um, as a result of the um, the the acquisition with the nuclear facility and the menu taking over? Uh, there was a change in in taxable property. I think is is what happened. So we ended up receiving about two point six million dollars, or less than what we had anticipated. Uh, and the problem so the county was dealing with some of that those same issues. Uh, and so uh, this acquisition has caused us to really uh, reevaluate how we are going to respond to some of those potential changes as we think about whether well, this is something long term. Uh, and so we will continue to monitor that. Uh, Mr. Robinson and I had a conversation about it as he is monitoring where the revenues are coming right now mm -hmm. uh, to see uh, whether we're in line with where we were this, this previous year. Um, but once we get more information, I'll be coming back to you uh, with some potential recommendations. But all that said, even though we received about $2.6 million less in revenue than we had anticipated, uh, we still ended the year about $200,000 in the black. Uh, and so most people would anticipate if you have a $2.6 million less uh, that, that you're going to be in a pretty bad situation. Uh, but uh, due to your fiscal responsibility and outstanding job of my trusted finance director, we still ended up in good shape. Outstanding job. Thank you, Dr. Wayne. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. The uh, district uh, stipend. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. For your approval this evening, the superintendent recommends the board approve district stipend for classified staff for academic year 2020-21. This is presented to you in exhibit form. Can we get a motion? Mr. Chair. Yes, I make a motion we accept the superintendent re recommendation to approve district stipends for classified staff for academic year 2020 21. Exhibit one. Motion has been second. All the approved stipend contract show a raise of hand, right hand, please. <laughs> Seven of a vote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sullivan. All right. Board Chair. And that's me. Um, we'll say this right here. Who we'll say this? Okay. We'll say this right here. And on the last uh, meeting, uh, I do. Appreciate uh, your vote of confidence in me being in the chair. It's just the chair. Uh, I hold one vote just like everybody else on the board. But I want to thank you all, mostly for your prayers. I was sick on the last, the last board meeting. I was so sick. And I know through y'all prayers, God has, you know, uh, I talked to a lot of you on the phone, and all y'all are concerned. God has, has given me some of my strength back. I'm working on it. Okay. And uh, I just want to thank the board, Dr. Green, all of the, you know, staff that take on me. And I really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. Also, I just I feel that I have I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Let's tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. I have an outstanding vice chair, Pastor. You're outstanding. And I thank you for all you do for this community. Thank you. And as a friend, Ms. Harris, I thank you. As a community person, all you do for the children in this district, 
you know, things that you put on. All those things really mean a lot. Mr. Davis, I thank you for all that you do. Your community, man, always doing something for the church. Mr. C, I thank you for all you do. I right? call him. He, he, well, we got two principles on him yeah, on this board. And I thank you. Now I want to thank our newest board member, both of our newest board members, Dr. Harris. I want to thank you. Sometimes a thankless job, Dr. Harris. Yeah. It's, it's going to be days. Yeah. It's going to be a burden on me. But, but thank you for running and you, you persevered with being a uh, district. And I think that's district six. Is that right? Thank you so much. Ms. Renee Green, 30 some year teacher in this district. Thank you. For giving back. I really appreciate it. And saying all that, Dr. Green, Superintendent of the Year in the state of South Carolina. Thank you, Doc. You have made us proud. This board has something to really be proud of. And I'm not just talking about him being the Superintendent of the Year, but where, where we came from. Y'all don't remember. Do you remember? We used to be here. We used to be here two o'clock in the morning. Board members. I mean, it's crazy. And we'll order all the staff to be here and just sit here for nothing. We didn't came a long way. I just want y'all to understand that. Thank you, Ms. Brown, for being our court. Thank you, Dr. Adrian. Thank you, Ms. So. I want to thank everyone. At this time, if there's no more, make the motion to adjourn. Make the motion to adjourn. Sir, thank you. Motion to adjourn. I'll raise your hand. All right, we got seven of them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please pay for the papers in. Thank you. 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 Thank you.